What's up, my wizards? My wizards, what's up? It's Deb from SBMTG. You know, we got some Wednesday Ravnica Legion spoilers for you, and there's a bunch to talk about. At least 17 cards to go through, but they might spoil something while I'm sitting here on the couch. Who knows? So, not much time to waste. Let's go ahead and get to it. I'll start the day with some limited playable stuff. It's actually easier to translate vocally, like this. This thing right here, Scorch Mark, it's called. It's just a magma spray. Except it costs twice as much as Magma Spray. It's two mana, instant speed, deal two to a creature. If it would die, exile it instead. That's not great. <laughs> I just would rather have Magma Spray. Obviously, we all would. But in Limited, you might still take this. It's at least relevant against Afterlife, guys. So there's that. But we also got to see Orzhov Imposter, which I guess the new Magma Spray kills this without you having to worry about Afterlife. But just in case you can't work out with your language skills what these words mean here, it's basically a two mana, one, two you know, Afterlife 1 that has Death Touch, which is actually pretty cool. And Limited, you know, I really like my Death Touch blockers. And when my Death Touch blockers can block a bigger guy trade up and still leave a creature behind, that's really good. So, contrary to its name, I actually think Imposter is real. We also finally got to see the last Guild Mage today, Gruul's Guild Mage, which is pretty good, you know? Some people have been underwhelmed by this from what I can tell so far. But I actually don't mind the first ability to keep the biggest blocker on the other side of the battlefield that might wreck your combat. Keep keep him out of combat. That seems fun. Um, but also, you know, turning one of your lands into a dude every turn, uh, even if the effect only lasts until end of turn, is actually not bad uh, for just three mana making a 4-4 every turn. It's fine. That's not bad. So, I actually don't mind this card. There are guild mages I like better, yes, but it's a fine guild mage for what it's worth. We also saw Dovin's Acuity, which is a cool little analog to Disinformation Campaign. Um, campaign, the blue-black campaign deck was actually fine on MTG over this past season. It never really broke through into the competitive tiers or anything, but it fair shit, you know, 5 owed It's fair share of leagues. It's a cool deck. Um, this, though, I don't think it has quite the power level. It doesn't interact with your opponent in the way campaign does. Um, it, it doesn't generate favorable two-for-ones in the way that that card did. It is a little bit easier to trigger. You know, it's easier just to cast a spell during your main phase, an instant during your main phase, than it is to have a surveil every turn, you know. Um, so I will say it's easier to trigger, but I don't like the payoff as much, and that's why I don't like the card as much, period. I think that in Sealed, especially if slower games and stuff, this is going to gain you four or six life over the course of a game, draw you three cards, but it is a very, very hefty mana investment, and I'm not sure that any constructed level deck wants to invest that much mana, especially in a do-nothing enchantment that doesn't interact with the opponent. Again, that's the reason Disinformation Campaign was even sort of kind of good. Uh, was the was the discard clause. This, I'm not quite sure about. We also got Scrabbling Claws back, which is a kind of cool reprint here. You know, there's some debate over whether this is better than Sentinel Totem or Silent Gravestone um, or worse than those cards. I think it's definitely fair to compare it to Gravestone. You know, they're both artifacts that cost one. They deal with the graveyard. They draw you a card eventually. But Gravestone costs a lot to draw you a card, you know, in, in, the, in the long run. This is just one mana to eventually draw a card. So if nothing else, it's just a, you know, really cheap egg that you can crack and get a little a card out of it. So if you're trying to build a cheap artifact payoff build with a card like Psy or something like that in Standard, then this is a cool one card uh, artifact to look at that can also hose like Phoenix decks, Golgari decks, or any other thing that's looking for you know value out of the graveyard or jumpstart or something. So I think this actually has a cool amount of uses and in an all artifacts deck that's probably going to be mostly janky, but still you know fun budget fun. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Um, then this is probably a noteworthy main deckable one drop that'll occasionally get you some very real value. We also got a couple more cards for this like really jank Gates deck that's like trying to come together. It's trying with all its heart, but it's just it's not looking good so far. Uh, we still got like a hundred cards left to see in the set, but I doubt it. But we did get to see Gates of Blaze, which looks like kind of the best piece for this deck that we've seen so far. In a way, like the the spiky part of me wants to constantly remind myself that like, okay, you have to forego curve on your first two turns, you know, in order to get a fiery cannonade out of this, a pyroclasm out of this on turn three. And it's probably not good enough, but if there's one thing the Gates deck needs, it's a sweeper. You know, it's a way to clear the board, keep themselves in the game so they can execute their always, you know, just destined designed to be long game sort of plan. So I don't know. Like if if Gates needed one card to make it real, it's probably not this, but it probably goes farther than any other card we've seen so far. There's also Harmony Square, which fails in not being a gate itself. It's not. 
which I think is a little bit of a fail, but there's some cool stuff you can do with this. You know, there's a gate that produces all five colors, just taps for any color mana. And that, that card is bad, but in conjunction with this, you get a reflecting pool, basically, um, thing going on. And that's, that's nice, you know. Um, plus, in conjunction with maybe a couple of other gates you might be playing in the deck, then you can you can easily envision a situation where this taps for four or even five different colors of mana. So, I want to like it. <laughs> and I also like, you know, the, the incidental life gain on this. Which, again, a gates deck is going to need. A gates deck needs to stay in the game long enough to execute its plan. And its plan usually involves getting like all the gates out <laughs> which means that you have to you have to play a very long game. You know what I could have and probably should have done just then has been like this is Harmony Square. It's bad. <laughs> Let's move on. I could have saved a lot of time for all of us but still. <laughs> Everybody knows you play in the gates deck. I'm not really that's not revolutionary information, but in any case, let's move on to the newest card. Huh? The newest card spoiled all day. This actually got previewed right before I came on. Uh, but I think this card is kind of <laughs> trash. So <laughs> let's get through it, though. Let's look at Captive Audience right here. And honestly, I think that they made this card just to name a card Captive Audience. Real, the best part, of, part about the card is the name. But it's seven mana. Five of black and a red for a mythic Rakdos enchantment. I hate that this took a mythic slot. Captive Audience enters the battlefield under, your con under the control of an opponent of your choice. At the beginning of your upkeep, choose one that hasn't been chosen. Remember, your opponent is, is choosing these options. Your life total becomes four. Or discard your hand. Or each opponent creates five 2-2 black zombie creature tokens. All right, so bad. This card's bad. I, I could probably move on, honestly. <laughs> that card is bad. I guess commander players might want this, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how much commander players are starving for a junky, too expensive Rakdos enchantment. I usually don't trash cards this much. I usually try to find the good in a card, but I don't know, man. Like, two of these options could actually be either, you know, no problem for an opponent whatsoever, or they could actually help, you know? Like, oh, I'm at three, I'll go ahead and put myself out of bolt range, thank you very much. Like, that's, I could actually help them in some in some narrow situations, but possibly. And they could have, like, one or no cards in the hand. Can they choose to discard their hand if they have no cards? I'm pretty sure they can. Um, so this just won't hurt. A lot of, like, aggro opponents or combo opponents have already played their hand out, you know? So, I don't know. They'll, like, almost never choose for you to get 5-5 five, five guys that, or 5-2-2 two, two guys or whatever it is. They'll necessarily have already <laughs> written off that option completely because they'll almost always choose a different option, you know? I just, I don't know, guys. Seven mana. Like, if this costs five, it might be like, oh, it's really interesting, you know? Do this with it. But uh, it's bad. Like, seven mana is way too steep, and it gives your opponent way too much choice. And I'm not a fan of that either, so... If I, if I have to, you know, save all my crap on a card energy for one card this spoiler season, it's this. And I'm sorry, because I'm sure this is somebody's exclusive preview, and I'm making them feel terrible. I apologize. This is not a personal attack. Um, but it's, it's, it's just a bad card, and there's just no way getting around it. But here's a Lumbering Battlement right here. This is 5 mana, 4 and a white for a 4-5 beast with Vigilance. And when it enters the battlefield, exile any number of other non-token creatures you control until it leaves the battlefield. Battlement gets plus 2, plus 2 for each card exiled with it. Okay, so I want to do some, like, janky Johnny stuff with this, you know. <laughs> there's always, you know, if you have repeatable enter the battlefield triggers that you want to abuse, you can just, like, exile two or three guys with this. Um, and then somehow sacrifice him, get rid of him. And you can repeat all those ETB triggers. That seems cool, but, like, <laughs> I don't know if that's ever going to happen. But you have to, like, three for one yourself when this comes into play to make it any good. <laughs> and unless you are doing something really tricksy, I just don't see it worth it. But I acknowledge that there might be some wacko interaction out there that just makes this card nuts. But even then, it's five mana. So even if there is some kind of crazy combo, it's at least fair, I would imagine. We'll see how good those words taste if I ever have to eat them. But here's Tome of the Guild Pact right here. It's five mana for an artifact. Whenever you cast a multicolored spell, draw a card. You can tap to add a mana of any color. Well, this is good in Commander, right? <laughs> I, just, I don't know anymore. Like, I'm just, I'm tired of, like, all, me and everyone else on YouTube and on Reddit and on the internet in law, at large. Um, whenever any card comes out that we don't like in standard, we're like, oh, this is a Commander staple to the end of time. And it's just, it's not every card can be that. You know, I know it seems like you got a lot of slots, but you've only got 100, and even then it's closer to like 65. <laughs> Real slots. 
um, in your deck. So I, mm, I don't. Not every card can be one, right? But this looks like um, an obvious go-to if you've got a bunch of multicolored cards in your deck. It's going to draw you a buttload of cards over a game, and it can help ramp you and make whatever mana you want. Like a eh, cool card. It's a very, very cool card. Um, but as far as standard goes, I don't know. It costs all the mana in the world for an effect like this. So, you know, maybe at some point, but five mana and you don't get any real payoff until you untap with it. I'm just not, not the biggest fan in constructed magic. Although we have been getting stuff for the multicolored gar deck lately. Like, check it out. We got Guild Pact Window, which is almost certainly not the correct translation of this card. <laughs> but this, that's what Mythic Spoilers got, and I've seen about five different translations. But I'm going with Guild Pact Window, whatever. It's two mana for an artifact, multicolored creatures you control, get plus one, plus one. Oh, well, it's good with Vindicator. Swift Blade <laughs> Vindicator, the double strike guy. But I don't know, man. <laughs> you know? Again, the multicolored deck is attempting to come together in sort of the same jank way that the Gates deck is trying to come together. You know, it signals a fun budget deck. But I don't know. Depending on what else we see, it could be entirely real. There might be hybrid mana one drops in this set. Again, we they might get dumped on the last day. We don't know. But there might be hybrid mana one drops in the next set that are really good. I actually think that'd be a fun excuse to, like, reprint Death, uh, Death Rite Shaman. Or just, like, call back to Death Rite Shaman. Um, plus, by the way, just digging deeper into this stupid conspiracy theory about hybrid mana one drops in the next set. Um, not only would it be a good reason to uh, reprint Death Rite or call back to it or something, but it might be a reason that we have cards like Isolate and Kaya's, you know, minus ability is just get rid of something, exile something that's one mana or less. Uh, it's definitely, we're pointing towards something of one CMC that's insane and we all need an answer for. So maybe the hybrid one drops in this set or the next set are that thing. So maybe, who knows. But if we do get hybrid mana one drops, you drop this on turn two as your anthem effect. I could see that. Being a pretty good, well, that's fine. Uh, who knows? But as it, as it stands, I'm just not a huge fan of dropping this on turn two into, you know, a multicolored guy on turn three. There's some really cool options with that, but I just think that in terms of standard power level, there's probably a lot better stuff you could be doing. That said, this is a budget channel by nature, so get ready for the multicolored deck, especially considering we get stuff like Hero of Precinct 1. This is the best card for the multicolored deck we've seen so far. It's two mana, one and a white for a 2-2 human warrior, and whenever you cast a multicolored spell, you create a 1-1 white human creature token. Now, the reason that I like this card so much isn't because of its application in a strictly I play nothing but multicolored stuff deck. It's not necessarily that. It's actually because this works so well in so many different things in standard right now you know if you flex boros a little bit you play more vindicators you play more tajiks aurelia's in that deck too this could actually create a bunch of guys for you over the course of a game pretty easily same thing obviously in selesnia where you might start playing shauna in that deck because you have this card but you've already got imara you could fit knight of autumn into that deck flower flourish is especially important with a card like this because it's just a one mana there's other just one mana you know, um, uh, hybrid mana split cards in this set, like the Rakdos one just costs one mana. You can see things like that being really, really good with a card like this. So I'm actually not counting it out at all. Even in Orzov, it has some significance at the very least. You've got Pitiless Plunderer or whatever. Pitiless Pontiff, that's your name. Um, the, the, the two drop aristocrat thing and you've got like Tesa and a couple of other you know multicolored cards in that deck so something like this in an aristocrat shell could actually produce a lot of value for you and a lot of sacrificable bodies so I actually think this thing has some game and a real chance but I'm not going to compare it to Young Pyromancer. I'm not falling into that trap. But here's Cinder Lash right here. Good two-drop enchantment for Gruul. There's a lot of enchantments for Gruul here in this set. It's just a red and a green. Whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, Cinder Lash deals one damage to that player. And you can pay one and sacrifice Lash to destroy an artifact or enchantment and have Lash deal two damage to that permanent's controller. This is so hot that people are talking about seeing modern play, you know, over things like Destructive Revelry, whatever, but I'm not sure. Uh, as far as standard play goes, yeah, it's probably a pretty good sideboard card. <laughs> you know, it hoses a couple of different things, any kind of stormy deck in standard. You know, red, I guess, is it Drake's, if you want to say that. This, this helps to hose. Plus, control decks in general that play almost nothing but non-creatures. Um, this definitely is very, very good against just on the first line of text. And it might be worth skipping a turn to almost guarantee, you know, three, four, five extra damage to an opponent over the course of a game. So I really like that, and it's a difficult permanent type for a lot of decks to deal with. But sacrificing it to be able to destroy a search for his counter, 
that's also very good. Or, you know, um, there's other stuff. Legion's Landing, you can go ahead and get rid of that before it flips over in a lot of games. There are definitely a lot of applications for this card. And after you break something, it even heaps more damage onto the opponent. So the card's pretty much always going to guarantee some damage for you, which I really, really like about it. It lets you keep aggressive, you know, it lets you stay aggressive, guarantee damage while still being able to take out problem permanents you might care about. The ability to take out enchantments is especially important in a format with Ixalan's Binding and Conclave Tribunal. There's a bunch of stuff. You might want to deal with History of Banalia. You can play this as a proactive answer to a card like History. So there's just so much good going on with this card and any problem artifacts that might surface in the format, Immortal Sun, Treasure Map, stuff like that. This is also a good answer to. So I like the amount of play on this card, and I don't think that it's quite main deckable, but it is an amazing sideboard piece. But up next here is Font of Agony. This is just a black mana for an enchantment. Whenever you pay life, put that many blood counters on Font of Agonies. And you can pay a black and a colorless to remove four blood counters from Font of Agonies and destroy target creature. Now, I am really not sure about this one. I've actually had a bunch of people ask me, more so than usual at least, about how I feel about this card. And I, I really want to, you know, not, I don't want to disappoint you, but I really don't think that it's incredible. Let me just put it that way. Um, yeah, there's a lot of ways that we pay life uh, on good cards in this format right now. Doom Whisperer, uh, uh, Argyle's Bloodfast is probably the most noteworthy example, but there's a couple of other good ways to pay life. Adanto Vanguard. Um, if you want to dip into white is a good, a great example too, because every time you make Adanto indestructible, you also get to kill one of their guys for a mana investment. So all of that is good. And we've got black stuff like Moment of Craving and Braskets Contempt to help stabilize our life total. I like everything about that, but I'm just not sure that it comes together into a perfect card. And even if you are incidentally playing some of these cards anyway, I'm not sure that it's worth the slot. That's really a lot of cost. It's more cost than it seems to get this effect when you could just be playing removal in your deck anyway. So I just don't know, all in all, if this is really destined to see real play. But another card that I kind of feel a similar way about, and I sort of feel shame about the way I feel about it, is Priest of Forgotten Gods. Now this is two mana, one and a black for a human cleric. It's a one-two. You can tap and sacrifice two other creatures. Any number of target players each lose two life and sacrifice a creature. You add two black to your mana pool and draw a card. Okay, so here's the deal. I like this card. Um, I actually do, even though I said I feel a similar way, I like this more than the last card. But I'm not sure if it's what we're looking for. It's a free sacrifice outlet. It only occurs once a turn, but you do get to sacrifice two guys. Uh, the other side of that is that you have to sacrifice two guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, having two guys in the battlefield isn't necessarily difficult, but getting like multiple triggers out of this, reliably tapping it every turn, may be a little tough. Don't get me wrong. It's good with Afterlife, obviously, because you sacrifice Afterlife guys to fuel it, and you get more after you know you get more creatures to feed to it on the next turn which could be pretty good but you're probably not looking to get a ton of activation out of this uh, activations out of this card in a given game that said it does look like they may have boosted it to two toughness specifically to survive chain whirler and a couple of other important cards that you kind of have to survive if you're going to be taken seriously so it looks like the card is a little pushed for standard play especially considering that yes the upsides are insane <laughs> Like, them having to um, to get rid of a dude is is crazy. Um, and you adding mana and drawing a card is specifically ridiculous because you're adding mana to help you cast whatever you actually draw, which is very good. Historically, that's fantastic. So the, the upside to the card is unbelievable. But having to have a couple of extra creatures out in the first place, you have to sacrifice other creatures. This can't be part of what you sacrifice. Um, that's not, I don't know, man. It's just, there's an awful lot of restriction. There's an awful lot of red flags here, but again, like the, the ceiling though, y'all, you know, <laughs> I don't, I don't have to tell you that. I'm sure that a lot of people are probably really happy and want to know how I feel about this and think I'm going to freak out about it, but I'm actually really reserved on it. Cause again, yeah, I acknowledge like Sistine Chapel ceilings, dirt floor though. But okay, guys, we got a brand new card. I've reloaded Mythic Spoiler like five times while I'm sitting on the couch. And this last time, a card finally popped up, so it must be like one minute old. But anyway, here's Biogenic Ooze. This is five mana, three and two green for a 2-2 two -two Ooze. When it enters the battlefield, create a 2-2 two -two Ooze. 
And at the beginning of your end step, put a plus one plus one counter on each ooze you control. And you can pay one and three green to create a two two green ooze. I actually kind of think this card is really good. <laughs> First time I'm reading it, yeah, like I, I read this card 30 seconds ago. Um, but it does put technically five power on the battlefield, you know? Um, the turn it enters the battlefield for just five mana, split across two bodies, which is good. That in and of itself is not actually bad. You can also, it's a creature factory on a stick. It creates a, pr a pretty high green investment, yeah, but I like a creature factory on a stick that makes its babies bigger as time goes on. So, I don't know. You've probably got better options for five mana in this standard. You know, there are a few you can think of off the top of your head, I'm sure, but I don't know, man. It's a little creature factory. It goes ahead and puts multiple bodies on the battlefield. Um, so, I don't know, man. Kind of like this. I'm not, again, I'm not sure that it's quite worth it for the five mana investment, but there is an awful lot to love here, if I'm not mistaken. But let's get to the two best cards of the day, starting with Incubation Druid. This is two mana, one and a green for a zero two elf druid, and you can tap it to add a mana of any type that a land you control could produce. If Incubation Druid has a plus one plus one counter on it, add three mana of that type instead, and you can pay five, three and two green to adapt three. This card is business. Business. Survives. Chain Whirler is the right creature type. That's pretty cool. Puts a counter on itself and becomes a pretty big creature. <laughs> you know, five toughness. After it adapts is no joke, but the ability to basically be a lotus, or, you know, when you when you tap it, as so long as it has a plus one, plus one counter on it, it's crazy. And it's worded right. It's not, you know, so long as it's adapted or something like that. It taps for three. No, it just needs a plus one, plus one counter. That's easy. Hadana's Climb is probably the easiest way to do this on turn three, and that is scary. Even if it was just the first bit of text and the power toughness for the mana cost, I think this card would be playable in and of itself, but just the ability to easily cheat plus one, plus one counters onto it and then tap for three, just ridiculous. I, honestly, this is the card that I'm going to like fangirl the most about today, um, but I'm trying to remain objective. I think the next card is actually a better card, all things considered, but this is probably my favorite card of the day, and I think it enables an awful lot of stuff, you know. It's going to be good in three color, but again, four and five color decks this could possibly enable. Um, so I just, I like it, guys. I like that it enables itself as well. Even if you're not doing plus one, plus one counter shenanigans, this can eventually enable itself and then tap for a buttload of mana, or again, just be a decent body. Five toughness is nothing. It's nothing to sneeze at. So I like this card <laughs> an awful lot. And I think it's one of the most impactful cards we've seen all spoiler season. But now for the card du jour. This is Skewer the Critics. <laughs> Wizard's really working out some frustration with that name. It's three mana, two and a red for a sorcery. You can uh, deal three damage to any target. That's kind of cool. Oh, but it's also spectacled for just a red. So sorcery, speed, lightning, bolt, ladies and gentlemen. This is very, very good. And we'll, uh, hope you can hear me. My microphone got turned around at some point. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is very, very, very good. And we'll see play in multiple formats. This is common. This is common. So it's going to see popper play until the end of time. Standard popper is in that mix, too, obviously. Plus, it's probably going to see modern play. <laughs> this is playable in a burn deck that's going to deal damage to them anyway. This is just, like, the... 48th copy of Lightning Bolt <laughs> that you can play in a modern deck at this point. So probably goes in there over some other stuff. I imagine you make some changes to fit this card, but in standard Jeebus, jeezy, crazy is this card ridiculous. I mean, this, this is probably the best spectacle payoff in the set. Like, I was all ready to say that Light Up the Stage is the best spectacle payoff in the set, but nah, man, this is, <laughs> this is pretty easily it, I think. This sorcery speed kind of sucks, but what, who freaking cares like this is good just in Rakdos Burn there's already a Rakdos Burn deck I don't know if you heard about Rakdos Burn but that exists um so there's that's pretty good um and that that deck existed in this past format uh and this just slides right in just mm, right in maybe we can cut sword point diplomacy finally in that deck but this also obviously just goes in the Rakdos spectacle deck that's probably gonna be pretty freaking good because of cards like this I just think that the addition of a card like this to standard really puts a standard burn deck over the top and, uh, yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. I know everybody was worried about Nexus of Fate. You know, oh, Bant Turbo Fog's looking good, man. It's a toxic deck. It's going to kill everybody. But no, man. <laughs> with, a, with a burn deck like this in the format, I don't think we got Jack to worry about in that department. 
But we made it, you guys. That's all the cards so far, at least, today. If they spoil anything else while I'm editing, I'll try to jump back on, let you guys know about it, because, man, it's a day of crazy cards. There's a lot of limited playable stuff, you know, don't get me wrong, but the good stuff is really, really good today. So, hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs> Let me know how you felt about it down there in the comments. Do all the YouTube stuff, like, share, subscribe if you haven't done it yet, especially subscribe. <laughs> I'm going to do all the hand gestures. I want to catch your attention. Um, it's important you subscribe because tomorrow morning, not late tomorrow night, I, I kind of become the late night spoiler guy around here, but <laughs> tomorrow afternoon, um, I'll be putting out my exclusive preview video, and you want to see it. I have told you before I'm super excited about this exclusive preview, and I am. So I just, that's it. You should see it. It's good. But <laughs> do that. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell to make sure you get all the content. Um, and deck techs are coming up super soon. Pre-release guide, top 25 video, all the stuff. It's coming up. So subscribe to the channel to make sure you get the infos. And then um, do all the other things, you know? <laughs> Click the link in the description to go over to my buddies at DCG Player. Pre-order anything you're excited about. Or just sealed product. Boxes of the set going for like 96 right now on their website, which is under MSRP. Oh, good deal. Do that. Click the link in the description. Helps me out just when you spend your time clicking the link. So if you want to help me out in that way, do it. But if you want to really help a brother out, then you can go over to the Patreon. Link in the description. Or patreon.com slash SBMTG. It's a good time to join the Patreon just for a buck. That's all I ask of you. Helps out a lot. But it's a good time because we're about to start putting out polls for what decks we want to see first this season. So it's actually uh, really important I, I, that you vote on those. So that you can only do it if you're a dollar member. So get over to Patreon, pledge a buck, help vote on what decks you want to see first this season. But I'm pretty sure that's it. Pretty sure that's all. This is another video where Ziggy's been down here. Oh, you can kind of see his head um, this whole time. But he's been really protesting. I'll go to move him around. He's like, Nye. But, it's your fussy baby. <laughs> but in any case, I'm pretty sure I'm done for this one after that long, long-winded spiel. But I will catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.